So for now, let's turn over to the business of the day. And uh, it is my pleasure to introduce today's plenary session. Our speakers are ready. They have been preparing for this moment. And we are going to listen to a session uh, entitled The Politics of Knowledge and Plural Visions for Equitable Agriculture and Food Systems. And with us today, we have Dr. Esha Shah, who is based here at Wageningen University. I will just introduce her as I invite her to join me on stage. Dr. Esha Shah is an environmental engineer by training and a social scientist by professional choice. Her past and current research is focused on anthropology, history, and philosophy of science and technology. She employs anthropological and historical methods in all her research and is increasingly using sources from popular culture, that is films and fiction. And um, autobiographical life writings for her research and teaching. Since her doctorate, which uh, she attained here at this university, she has held research and teaching positions in the discipline of science, technology, science and technology studies, uh, which she did at the University of Sussex in the, US, in the UK and Maastricht University in the Netherlands. Dr. Shah, who is right here, please the floor is yours. Just come and introduce the rest of your speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Um, so good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, as we've been already said, actually, this plenary uh, session today is on the politics of knowledge and plural visions for equitable agriculture and food systems. Um, we are going to have three very esteemed speakers for this plenary. Um, I will first introduce all the three speakers and then give floor to each one of them for around 15 to 20 minutes. We will then have time for discussion for almost 30 minutes uh, uh, when we all will come together we bring all the speakers together at that time in um, panel discussion um, so I'm going to introduce uh, all three speakers one after the other our first speaker is um, Professor Andrea Cornwall she is a professor of global and development Global Development and Anthropology School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London where she is also pro director research and development she is going to initiate the discussion with a presentation on decolonizing gender and development. Professor Cornell was formerly director of the Pathways for Women's Empowerment Consortium, a research program with hubs in the Middle East, Latin America, South Asia, West Africa, and also a global hub focusing on global policies on women's empowerment and gender equality. Professor Conwell is well known among the scholars of gender studies as she has published widely on gender and development, including uh, feminisms and development, contradictions, uh, contestations and challenges, which she has co-edited with two other scholars, um, which is published by Z Books in 2013. Another of her book, which is um, important to be mentioned here, is on co-edited book with other two colleagues, uh, uh, the two scholars on mass Masculinities under neoliberalism, published again by Z Books in 2017. Um, welcome, Professor Conwall. We are very much looking forward to your keynote speech. Our second speaker is Amon Ashaba. Aman Mwan, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing this correctly. Um, I'll try again. Uh, Amona Shaba Mwan, lecturer in the School of Women and Gender Studies, um, Mekar University in Uganda. He will then provide insights on plural feminisms, pathways, and practices towards equitable food systems, visions for the future. He holds a PhD in sociology from Stellenbosch University, South Africa. Um, Dr. Mwan um, currently teaches men 
women's studies, masculinities and development, gender and sexuality and feminist theory. Um, his research interests are in critical studies on uh, man and masculinity, ethnographic and narrative forms of qualitative research, and gender and politics. His current research project interrogates ways in which feminist activism encounters notions on man and masculinities in the implications and the implications these dialogic interactions have for critical feminist theory and practice. Welcome, Amon. Um, it is very important that when we talk about gender question, we have to bring men also into the discussion. And I'm very glad that we have a man who is also working on masculinity issues um, with us. Um, our third speaker is Tanya Ilalia Martinez Cruz. Uh, she is a postdoctoral researcher. University of Greenwich, and she's going to address whose who's food sovereignty and counters and discounters in transnational space, um, reflections and lessons from indigenous people in Latin America. Um, Martinez Cruz um, is an interdisciplinary scholar. She holds a PhD in social sciences from Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Um, currently, she is a postdoctoral researcher in public health at the Natural Resource Institute of University of Greenwich in the UK, working on nutrition, gender, and indigenous people's food systems in the Peruvian Amazon. Martinez Cruz has collaborated in international development for more than 12 years, and she has engaged in projects on sanitary engineering, biofuel production, water management and irrigation, agricultural research and development, climate justice, hold your breath, there is more, gender and social inclusion, nutrition, and food security and sovereignty. Um, as an indigenous woman and researcher, Martinez Cruz also promotes the conservation of indigenous knowledge as key to the biocultural diversity and to tackle global problems. Very glad to have you. Um, Tanya, if I could call you actually um, to have among uh, to be with us. Um, uh, so welcome, Tanya. Um, the speakers will then come together. So I'm going to um, invite each speaker um, to come forward and give their keynote speech. And then um, at the end of uh, their speeches, uh, we, they will all come together in a panel when the floor will be open for the audience to pose their questions. So be ready for your questions and comments. Um, I would like to now invite the first speaker, Professor Andrea Conwell, to present her keynote speech. Professor thank Conwell. you very much and thank you for the introduction and also for the invitation. It's a, a great honor to be with you. So I'm going to talk at a very broad level um, about decolonizing gender and development um, in, and making reference to some of the issues around cultivating equality, but sort of looking historically um, and also uh, sort of from a broader political perspective on, uh, on uh, the, the process of development. Um, so to start with, decolonizing gender and development, it calls for challenging development's continued coloniality, as well as decolonizing the way we think about gender. So I'm going to be looking at both of those things. So if we see the history of developments and it, that history seen through the lens of the violence of colonialism in all its forms, structural, epistemological and other, we can see how it was the colonial imposition of the gender binary that produced some of what we now see as women's disadvantage and disempowerment and men's prerogative and impunity. Developments often presented as if it was a post-World War II project. And this conceals the inconvenient fact that the British Empire presented the very much the same arguments for intervention in people's everyday lives as many development agencies do today, and not for dissimilar reasons um, of legitimation. So colonialists may have been represented as taking up women's rights, as for example, in the uh, efforts to end early marriage in India, FGM in Africa, for example, of which today's campaigns can be direct echoes. But they did so by promoting a version of women as being vulnerable, virtuous, and victim that's still part of the tropes that are used to present women as objects for development's investment. So these continuities between development uh, representations in the present and actions in the present and colonial uh, projects of the past bear closer inspection. And in thinking about decolonizing gender and development, these are the kind of questions that I think we need to be asking. So we need to look at, we need to understand and challenge assumptions about men and about women that are part of the colonial legacy that are pursued in the present by the development industry. Binary gender is a colonial import. It's one that came with colonial Christian ideas about sex, 
and that led to laws on the statute books of more than 70 countries that prohibit same-sex relations. Homophobia is a colonial export that continues to grip the mindsets of those in previously colonized countries. There are many cultures in which there were more than two genders, including Native American Indians, Yoruba and Hindu gods are example of the diversity of gender expressions. So we need to recognize the impact of the heteronormativity that came with colonial development. We need to recognize the colonial origins of concepts such as the household and within it, the idea of the male breadwinner, which are still so present even now um, in the ways in which development structures interventions. And I, I would argue also in the sphere of agriculture and the discourses around gender and development in relation to that sphere. So for example, uh, Lisa Lindsay, Ifi Amajume and Felicia Ekajuba's work uh, on Nigeria shows how recent an invention the idea of the male uh, breadwinner is uh, for parts of Africa where women's own account enterprises, whether in trading or agriculture, have long sustained households. So interrogating some of the ideas that are kind of received ideas on how society is organized needs to happen at the time of, uh, at the same time as looking back and, and seeing how that was patterned by colonial uh, representations of how households ought to be organized that came with the imposition of colonial rule. We need to locate the colonial imposition of ideas about men and women, the relations between them, uh, in the per pervasive influence of imported religious normativities on institutions. So in African countries colonized by Britain, for example, historians have shown how this was embedded through mission schooling and the colonial promotion of Christian notions of the virtuous wife and mother through colonial development in uh, interventions, which ranged from domestic education, community development, to who was considered to be a farmer, who was able to hold ration cards or cards for sale of farm produce and so on. And these have been uh, critiques that have been explored already in the field of agriculture. But again, this idea of how these notions have come through and carry on being perpetuated in the way in which gender and development and development in general uh, treats the category um, of, of women, the woman farmer and, and, uh, and gender relations in relation to the present. The gender inequalities that were perpetuated by development practice by the time that gender got to be named and recognized by development studies, uh, which is in the 1970s, were as Esther Bozerup has so rightly diagnosed the legacy of colonialism. So addressing this legacy and the enculturation of development thinking and practice with this colonial mindset, and I'm not referring here only to the global north, but also to the extent to which that mindset has shaped scholarship and governance in the global south, as part of the interrelationship that is coloniality, calls for a far more concerted effort to be paid to decolonizing gender as part of a bigger project of decolonizing development. So to do this, we need to look beyond the frame of gender equality. And one way we can do this, I would argue, is to think in terms of what I'm gonna call the three E's, empowerment, emplacement, and encroachment. First, we need to think about what empowerment is all about. Um, and I've done a lot of work on empowerment over these years. Um, thinking about the extent to which a radical idea that was transformational got to be um, emptied of a lot of its contents. So we need to reclaim the radical promise of empowerment. Development's enthusiasm for empowerment has been based on the assumption that women and girls lack power and they need development to provide them with opportunities to earn money to be able to gain such power. But what is this power? Earning and spending power, power to engage with the market, to drive growth through consumption, does this actually give women and girls the power to redefine their subjectivities and their relationships? Decolonizing gender and development is about asking these questions and looking at what can we do to enable women to redefine their own lives in their own ways, rather than be disciplined by development agencies, narratives and interventions. Second, the concept of emplacement helps us to place our attention on the lived experience of place. It's also about recognizing the significance of context in any understanding of gender and power and of the histories of place that are etched through with a legacy of colonial power relations and the impact of colonial ways of thinking and knowing. And third, the concept of encroachment is a useful frame through which to view the effects of colonial development policies and practices and the continued coloniality of current development concepts, uh, policies and practices. By imposing patriarchal and heteronormative assumptions, development encroaches on people's integrity. This makes us alert to the work that needs to be done to prevent encroachment and to enable all people to live in dignity and rights, no matter their gender. So applied to development, this brings a specificity of power relations, identifications and obstructions into view. And this allows us to bring the three E's of empowerment, emplacement and encroachment together analytically to inform our understandings. 
to do this focuses our attention understanding those obstructions all the things that get in the way of enjoying dignity and respect and substantive equality including in access to opportunities so what does it take to do this work of decolonizing development to do this work we need to begin with ourselves wherever we're located wherever our place is it's not enough to talk about distant others and their empowerment in the way in which development discourse tends to do without examining our own role in the encroachment on lives that has come with development or our own attachments to discriminatory ideas about gender, whether they're gender myths or patriarchal assumptions that women are unable to do certain things, certain kinds of jobs or need protecting or rescuing. Most of all, we need to be willing to take seriously the caution that the concept of encroachment presents us with and look not only at what we can do for women or what women can do for development, but at the possibility that ending all forms of discrimination on the basis of gender, including those arising from development's encroachment, might mean stopping doing things and redirecting resources and energies away from where they're currently spent to cultivating empowerment and through that to cultivating equality. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Cornwall, I think these are very thought-provoking ideas, um, particularly the three um, E um, framework that you have provided us. There is a lot to talk about that, um, and I'm sure that there will be many questions and comments about these three E framework that you have presented here. Um, I'm going to now invite, um, thank you very much, Professor Cornwall. Um, uh, I'm going to invite now um, the next speaker, um, uh, Amona Shaba Moin. Um, and Amon is going to, uh, Dr. Moin, Amon Wine is going to talk about plural feminisms, pathways, and practices towards equitable food systems, visions for the future. Floor is yours, Dr. Wine. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much. Uh, Cornwall, who, uh, whom I follow. Uh, I am particularly going to look at plural feminisms, uh, a, a little bit of demonstrating that through the nature of theorizing on the African continent, particularly from the Sub-Saharan Africa, and look at how these debates have shaped the kind of research in agriculture. Uh, I'm going to pick up on two uh, small cases from empirical studies from Uganda, which are researching in agricultural communities. And we look at how you know, researching experiences of women could contribute to understanding the kinds of oppressions they live in and the kind of negotiations they go in. Uh, so I want to note that globally, we have, we have noted uh, you know, progress in terms of Advancing, advancing ways of understanding uh, what inequality is, the nature inequalities take, from monolith approaches to looking at these inequalities as very complex and intersecting. And we, we have seen, for instance, the third wave feminist critical thought, paying attention to critiquing universal and totalizing frameworks of understanding gender oppression, uh, moving into understanding feminisms, which include in many ways, uh, ways of looking at multicultural, mild, ethnic, multiracial, and feminist studies around men and masculinity, postmodern, poststructural, uh, poststructuralism, black feminism, and African feminisms uh, that we have seen, you know, trying to rethink the concept of gender and how, you know, conceptualizing gender moves from gender as an essence to looking at how it is performed in everyday lives and how it is informed by particular contexts. Um, and of course, the whole of this trajectory has been drawn upon in different ways by researchers, by activists within the agriculture uh, sector. Um, sometimes not drawing on entire theoretical foundations, but picking up on particular concepts that they deploy in researching, but also in designing strategies to address inequalities in agriculture. I wanted to particularly point to African experiences of engaging with pluralism, uh, plural feminisms, noting that uh, the plurality of the African continent 
has been documented widely by African feminists, but also other feminists uh, interacting with the African continent. Uh, this plurality often comes in terms of the diversity of cultures and traditions, agricultural systems, but also political structures and uh, you know, political structures, colonial and pre-colonial, colonial and post-colonial encounters that have produced different gender relations on the continent. And in, in the mix of this, we have seen feminists arguing that we particularly might need to look for theoretical accounts that are able to engage with embodied gender experiences that are grounded in complex realities of African women everyday experiences. And so the, the, the idea that we need to look at women in their localities and study their experiences and work with them to be able to understand what oppression indeed is. Um, and one of the areas in which this kind of theorization has happened, looking at diversity, is the way different feminist positions have engaged with the concept of patriarchy, um, looking at its root cause, looking at um, how we need to engage or negotiate with patriarchy and the kinds of oppressions that it emits. I want to note that very recently we, we've, we've noted, we, we have, um, we, we've had a study at Makere University looking at men, marriage and women's land rights by one of the African feminists on the, on, on the campus. And she raised questions around consistent narratives in which women are often lumped together with children, youth, persons with disabilities, and looked at as a category in need of protection, which in a way affects or blocks the imagination of women's agency and what women can be able to do. You know, things that, you know, uh, Cornwall was talking about the exportation, the exporting of these binaries of gender into different, you know, British colonies. Raising this question of the categorization of women alongside all these other uh, categories of youth, children, and persons with disabilities. Uh, Ashchile, Professor Ashchile, who theorizes this, challenges us to start looking at women in their specific everyday experiences to be able to look at the multiple ways that these women engage and negotiate with the kinds of oppression they encounter. And in similar fashion, um, other feminists, uh, e.g. Slavia Tamari, have called for decolonizing knowledge around gender, whether in research and in theory, <clears throat> particularly looking at how we can move beyond the binaries of working with culture as if it is in position with rights and demonstrating ways in which this binary tends to conceptualize relations amongst women in problematic ways, restricting what they can be, but also what they can be able to do. Um, so looking at, at these kinds of binaries and how scholars and activists are increasingly engaging with these binaries, calling for moving beyond these binaries, I wanted to pick up on one of the key study, uh, empirical studies that is looking at rethinking the position of women's rights in customary land rights. Um, in this study, um, the author seeks to challenge the general understanding of women as not owning land within the cultural context and draws on Ugandan experience in 2015 where women protested over uh, demarcation of land and allocation of this land in the northern part of the country to be a game reserve. Uh, during this protest, women stripped, they stripped naked before government officials protesting plans to gazette their land as a game reserve. And in their protest, they strongly condemned conversion of what they called their land into a game reserve. 
And they argued that the stripping was really the last resort, the key resource that they could have under their means. And when they were doing this, they asked when uh, they asked if we allow the government to do this, what shall we feed our children on? You know, you know, going through all these experiences, uh, the author asks, um, in view of the dominant discourse that women do not own land, why would women of this community in the northern part of Uganda passionately defend a land system that we want to argue that marginalizes them to the core? And when these discussions emerged within the academia and the university, there was an acknowledgement that indeed experiences of this nature enable us to challenge and interrogate the dominant discourses about women's marginalization, helplessness, and victimization. But they also reveal the need to appreciate the nestedness of gender relations and the priority of women's positions and experiences beyond women as not owning land, women as marginalized, women as helpless. The other experience I wanted to quickly draw on is regarding communal gardening, the cultural practice of communal gardening, which is practiced in the northern part of the country, Uganda, and which is part of an empirical study that is going on at the university, which I am part of. This cultural practice, communal gardening is called alea, and it is one of the contemporary agricultural practices that is still persistent after this region had experienced 20 years of war. Um, in this communal gardening, it, it is coordinated by two leaders in a community, a female leader and a male leader. And these leaders are elected by community members. But majority of the activity of organizing agricultural practices, uh, opening up the land, and the entire cycle of agricultural practice is highly modulated and coordinated by women. And what happens in this, you have 10 households coming together and tilling the land of an individual woman in a group. And these women were telling us what this cultural practice of collective gardening enables them to do within the context of post-war um, Northern Uganda. One of the things they pointed out is that this social process foregrounds their collective action, their ability to do a lot of work within a short time, but also to resist certain malpractices on land, like you know, taking over people's land in the, in the dynamics of increased marketability of land. We, they also told us that this collective action enables women and men to have collective knowledge on whose land and where it starts and ends. Wider knowledge in terms of boundaries and demarcation and DTC. And in the context of post-war where land conflicts have increased, the groups of these women have become very essential in land conflict resolution in a community that you would, on the face of it, look at it as patriarchal. The third aspect that they raised was that collective agricultural practice enabled women to till wider gardens, which gardens are labeled or named after women. And so you have garden X called, you know, a person's woman, a woman's name. And so gardens, in the entire village are named after women, which women argued that this is one way of claiming access to this land, utilization of this land, but also gaining a sense of belonging in a community where social belonging is becoming a challenge. 20 years of conflict produced different relations in which children whose fathers are not known are coming up and people are asking, where do you belong to which clan? And so they argued that this sense of land relations is enabling them to have a belonging. And so for them, 
it moved from land as an agricultural resource to land as a resource to enable them to nurture a sense of identity in a community whose identities are fruit in post-conflict situations. The last item they talked about was on how collective gardening promoted higher agricultural productivity because they, they would till expansive spaces of land, but also as they did the tilling and literacy, they would engage in social conversations that brought them together and created spaces for collaboration for other purposes like forming financial village saving schemes to enhance their economic productivity. Well, it looks like uh, we have lost uh, Amon um, Wine. Um, could you hear us, um, Dr. Oh, sorry. Uh, do, yeah. I, I seem to have dropped off. Let me conclude on this okay. um, one minute. That um, this, this kind of cultural organized way of tilling land enabled women to form groups to advance their economic uh, interests, but also to share their experiences in the conflict and in the context of post-conflict. And they noted that it seems agricultural practices are moving beyond livelihoods to issues of psychosocial therapy. And, and so I was looking at the kind of diversity of interests that emerge from what looks like collective agricultural practice. And thinking that these experiences enable us to have a critical focus on women, not as poor, rural, post-conflict helpers group, and a patriarchal oppression, but as agents actively engaging with realities of different forms of disadvantage. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we thought that we lost you for a minute, but you were very much there. Um, thank you again for very interesting um, thoughts here, particularly um, foregrounding the questions of how we need to understand the embodied gender experiences and how should we foreground them actually in understanding um, the gender relations. Um, uh, so now we have a next uh, speaker, uh, Tania Eulalia uh, Martinez-Cruz. Um, Tanya, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I want to share a, a little presentation. It's more pictures than anything else. Um, but let me see if I can do that now. And if you can see my presentation, you should be able to see, right? Yes. Okay. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the invitation to this panel. And I'm really excited and fascinated by, by the conversations or the topics that uh, Andrea and Wynne have addresses. And in a way, I would like to continue the conversation in the line of the colonization of knowledge uh, following the three E's that um, Andrea mentioned, but also talking a bit on the boundaries and territoriality that uh, Wynne mentioned. So uh, I'm also gonna come and problematize a bit on the issues we face many times as practitioners and in researchers in the field. Um, so let me start. Um, as, agriculture, as an agricultural practitioner, I always learn more when I visit communities because that's where I feel like many of the assumptions I have as a researcher get confronted. In 2012, I was working on a project that sought to improve the national food security in Mexico, and which was framed around maize because maize is a staple crop in Mexico. As we arrived to one of the communities, we, the experts, considered that the best way to improve the local food systems and food security was turning the traditional maize intercropping system called milpa into a monocropping that could uh, use improved varieties and therefore yield much more maize. Farmers laughed at us and they said, no way we could do that because changing our system would also be threatening our resilience, our resilience and our culture. Why? Well, 
they say that they have learned through the years that when there are several extreme events, and even though for many years, the agricultural policy in Mexico tried to push a farmers to move into the cities to become laborers and sort of a committed to provide um, food supplies to different stores that the government implemented. Farmers learned that even if you have money, when disasters come and you have a money, but no access or something fails in the policies at national level, they might have nothing to eat. So uh, having their farms, their systems, on the one hand, it's linked to resilience, but at the same time, it's linked to culture and identity. Usually when we talk about crop production and food security uh, or food sovereignty, in some cases, let's think of the FAO using both terms um, valid as a mean to achieve a food, food provision or provide food to food. Uh, we think of production, but we think much less in gathering, which is one of the unique characteristics, I think, of indigenous food systems. For example, in the Arizona desert, in the dry season of the year, the tojonos pray to Mother Earth and are able to survive and make a living by collecting the saguaros they have in the desert. Also, I love giving the example that when in Mexico, going back to these milpa systems, when it seems like we have harvested everything, still people can make a living in the, in the season that there's no crops left in the field by digging roots or collecting wild edibles uh, from the environments. So this links to the next point again uh, with the recent crisis of COVID-19. Um, what many people did when the crisis came was to enclose themselves in the communities, making use of the territory. And then we go to the boundaries. Why? Because they felt that that was the best way to face the pandemics given the lack of infrastructure in health. Um, and that was only possible, or it's only possible when communities have the rights to their territories, which sadly, it's not the same for all the indigenous communities or many communities around the world. Um, so uh, I was fascinated how the experiences of Aguajun or other indigenous peoples said they had to go or close the entries of the river so people would not come and bring the disease. But also how experiences of grandmothers that have no children in some of the communities uh, said that they were safe within the communities because others would take of each other, would take care of each other. So again, when we address many of these issues of food security or food sovereignty, we cannot leave out the territory or we cannot just come with the eyes trying to solve one issue when the problems are usually multi multidimensional and we need to think in a bigger picture. So despite the last years, we have a moved into the participation agenda and we have reflected a lot as researchers and implementers on how we should increase a participation of communities uh, in relation to indigenous peoples, how we can develop intercultural models um, that can respect uh, the rights of indigenous peoples. There's still a gap to others. Another example that a recent leader shared with me was that he said that he's been involved in uh, different approaches to improve food security, health, education in his country. But he recognizes that his voice actually has never, or he feels it hasn't been taken seriously. So his shared experience on how he was invited by a, by a minister of social development to a meeting, and he took some sacred worms with him and offered them to the minister. He said, I bring you this sacred, worms to you uh, because they are important and a, 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 let's say a gift from my people to you. Immediately the reaction of the Minister of Agriculture of Social Development was, you, what do you want me to do with this? And the reaction of the leader was, well, when you bring policies, when you bring recommendations that do not fit the reality of my people, that do not understand how do we live, why do we make some choices, that's how we feel, like you're imposing something on us. 
would be better if you could ask us first what we want, why do we want it, and how do we want it? As we continued the conversation, it was clear that he had many recommendations in the mind and that he had been engaged actively um, in policy recommendation, but he felt that his voice was not heard. He also wisely said to me that he recognizes the role of science and what science could add to communities. And one of them could be training his own people uh, or local people that could engage actively in research and policy making because they could understand the struggles people have, the aspirations and needs. This takes me to another point. Um, and I want to believe that as scientists and development practitioners, we are driven to fill science gaps and to propose solutions to existing problems. But the work is not apolitical. It's shaped, it's shaped by our assumptions, our training experiences, and sadly or not sadly, depends on how we look at it, also on the people that it's funding our research because there are priorities that we need to fulfill. And we are also pushed to bring up the most a recent or trendy or fashionable uh, advances into science if we want to convince a donor to invest or why your ideas are worth it, right? So uh, going back to, 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 to another example of one of these communities, I was uh, working in reintroducing a project recently uh, in one indigenous community after two years of pandemics. And as I was talking to the leaders, in theory, uh, we had presented our project two years ago, uh, but I got trapped in reflecting into the methodol methodologies that we implement, but also in ethical issues. A community leader to start, even though we have to, or we should have this prior and informed consent when we, in we intervene or do work with communities, to me, it sounded that many times, and this is not the first time I see it, and it's a reflection for my work too, even though we design many of the strategies to be participatory, sometimes it feels that we are just coming to validate what we have set and what we have proposed in our research proposals and not so much it's co-designed with the communities. One of the leaders asked me, how much do I have to pay if I want to access to the information that you are generated? To me, it was really interesting that he asked me this and I learned it later that he and his community had been engaged with extractive science, that a, it was common for him to see that many researchers come, do their science, what we call parachute science, and they live, live. One of the questions that came to my mind is like, how can we, um, or why these communities are working with us if it seems that there's a mismatch on what we are proposing, what actually we can offer to the communities. So I learned that because many of these communities have been engaged in territory struggles, they welcome many times researchers because they could become a, plat a platform to voice many of their struggles. So let's, let me give you another example. Usually when I'm working with activists on climate change, Many of these activists or researchers tell me, so how is that people is experiencing climate change in the communities? The response is kind of obvious because many of these communities do not frame their problems around climate change, but more around the defense of territory. So how do we can design things that fulfill what we need, we want as researchers, policymakers, but at the same time that can satisfy the agendas of local people? How can we commit to create a research that can have winners in both sides and do not uh, show as usual that science and some groups uh, can have more power than others within these communities. So other of the struggles I constantly have, it's also how do we design methodologies that are less extractive, even though we say we want to increase participation, even though we come and dialogue with the communities, how do we commit in a longer term to something that is actually valuable for the communities, whether it is because we want to preserve 
if I'm an ethnobiologist, seeds or plants and take them to a gene bank, or whether it is something that I'm addressing, such as nutrition. One of the questions as an indigenous woman that also come frequently to my mind when I'm doing this research and I find myself trapped into different worlds is how my family or my people would feel when someone like me comes to the communities and does the same sort of research and applies the same sort of methodologies, would that be extractive or not? Then it comes to the ethical questions. How, how can we change and frame things a bit different? I don't have the answer, but I guess many of you might have faced the same issues as we work in development. Um, so something I love at link people is like many times it feels a, when we are trying to wear different hats at the same time, when we are trying to satisfy the needs of um, the science, the needs of our donors when we want to be publishing trend research, but also we want to engage actively with communities, it feels like we are dating many people at the same time. While we are trying to fulfill or satisfy all of them, we can disappoint many of them at the same time. So what, what comes next? It seems like I'm just criticizing and I'm not giving like clear lines or where should we go and what we could do. Uh, so recently we published a paper with some of my colleagues that are ethnobiologists and it's about the colonizing institutions, projects and a scholarship. And that meant to reflect on how, what we, what we could do differently if we want to support communities and also change a bit the rules of the game in terms of a science and development. So I wanna focus just on, 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 on three, key, two key issues. One of them is in how we should, or we as a researchers could advocate to realign institutional priorities and support community leadership. By that, we mean a, that many times, whatever that it's an output, or something that we commit to our donors or uh, to journals or, the, or, or many of these communities or the worlds we move within as scientists, it's not necessarily linked to what communities actually like. Is there any way that we could also commit as researchers to try to negotiate with donors on how we could also create information or things that could meet people's needs at a local scale? That's a question. Is there a way we could do that? I've seen, for example, recently a, that one way to do that, it's a, with the, communi the, com the committees that evaluate projects that involve not only scientists, but also try to engage communities or local leaders that sort of endorse whatever that we are proposing, because there is a need to also engage communities in a different level. How successful that can be, I don't know yet, but I think it's a good attempt to try to make a, some shifts in power and change a, this balance. Um, in terms of projects, it's also it, it also sounds nice to say we can commit or we should commit uh, to communities, but to what extent we actually can commit? Creating relations of trust can take many years. And to avoid parachute science, I agree with what this indigenous leader said. I think we should also try to invest in local capacities so we can uh, have local researchers that sort of uh, understand better the local context. But one of the, uh, let's say, weak points of that, I was talking recently with a Navajo friend and she was criticizing researchers like me because she says that the system has trapped us. When we aim or go to university and we are for in many of these Western schools, um, we end up also following many of the models and we end up playing the rules of the game and not committing so much with our com to our communities in the end. So this is just some of the reflections and the struggles I find myself trapped in and I'm pretty sure many of you also find yourselves trapped into many of these discussions. This is it, thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Tanya, it was very inspiring. Um, so we have a few questions actually um, raised in 
um, the chat, but I have been also asked to again um, uh, sort of notify the participants of this plenary session that if you have any questions or comments, please um, write them down in um, the live session on the right hand side of the um, the live session. I, I think you would be able to identify that, that more than I do. Um, so we have a few questions, actually. I would really like to now uh, raise these questions um, for the entire panel to consider. Um, one of the questions that has come up is, and I'm going to read it, that um, this is actually regarding, and this relates to um, Andrea Cornwall's um, uh, keynote speech on decolonizing, um, decolonizing mindset. So it's difficult to undone what has been done if gender structures, just a minute, if gender structure that existed in pre-colonial times have been transformed or um, eliminated, can Dr. Cornwall um, say something about what decolonization means in this context. It can't uh, mean going backwards. So what does it mean going forward? I think this is a, an important question, actually, because uh, in my own um, work, I have seen that there is increasingly um, the debates on decolonizing uh, development actually goes back to the pre-colonial period. And it often ends up actually romanticizing or um, even glorifying the pre-colonial context in my own work I have shown that the pre-colonial societies were not so egalitarian. Um, they had their own um, very serious issues. So now when we uh, critique colonial legacy actually in our current period, where do we go? And what are our landmarks? What do we compare with? Is it going backwards uh, a solution? Um, it would be nice to have some thoughts uh, from Professor Conwell on this. Yeah, and I think uh, I'm very much with you um, on this about uh, let's not romanticize the past. This is also not about going back and saying, oh, it was so great and now we need to have something like it was. Uh, what I think the key point for me here is that the, there is a continued coloniality in the ways in which um, some development agencies and some development practices um, regard and treat women and men. So both in terms of the kind of assumptions about them, their need for empowerment or the kinds of things that they might uh, be, uh, you know, be doing, assumptions about their domestic arrangements, assumptions about what's going on in, in their everyday lives, which can come out of a set of very restricted lenses. Um, and I see this as a white person at who's worked in development um, and has kind of critically looked at development as an anthropologist. Um, thinking of how much from my own British culture um, is there in terms of shaping what people's assumptions are about people of all genders in, in other contexts. And I think uh, Tania made some of these points also, Emon has made some of these points in relation to the plurality of gendered expressions and also um, possibilities uh, in terms of relations in different places. So I guess what I'm saying is not let's go back, it's saying let's be aware of the extent to which a deep patterning of the ways in which representations of women and work with women um, has, you know, comes through from um, colonial assumptions which are cur currently still in, in development practice. Um, and let's be aware of those things and let's then start to really question and interrupt them and think about who's not being included, who's being um, completely obliterated in terms of our understanding of, of what's going on in their lives. Uh, from representations, but also from, from uh, access to resources and so on. And particularly, I think, linking not only normativities around gender, but also around uh, heteronormativity. So assumptions about people being married, about marriage being uh, a state in which, you know, all adults should be, and, and disregarding other forms of family forms and other kinds of relationships uh, in the process. Um, and disregarding relations between women and not necessarily sexual relationships, but other kinds of forms of relationality uh, and gender relations as part of those as well. So this imposition of the gender binary is a really unhelpful thing. And my argument is it came from um, colonialism and it's something which we need to question. Right. Um, 
Thank you very much for this response. Um, so in the spirit of engaging both um, uh, Professor Conwell, you and Dr. Mohan, actually, I want to ask both of you actually to reflect on um, how do you think actually that some of this colonial mindset is so unconscious or so unrecognizable actually, or sometimes so insidious in our own cultural upbringing actually that it is very difficult even to identify and challenge actually um, Dr. Mann has work on man and masculinity, and particularly, and when his own talk, he actually foregrounded the question of embodied women's uh, experiences. But what about also looking into the embodied man's experiences and how to understand that these experiences are also shaped by patriarchal structures, and they often are not so um, not so liberating or empowering as we sometimes think from the other side. Um, so I would like to invite both uh, Professor Cornwall and Dr. Moan here to respond on uh, how this colonial mindset working through the patriarchal structures actually often get unrecognizable and how to really um, how to really work on identifying them, I mean, before we challenge them. I would give the floor to Dr. Moan first. Dr. Amon Mann, could you reflect a little bit? We would also very much like to hear your work on man and masculinity. Um, yeah, and unfortunately, my, my internet is a little bit unstable. Mm -hmm. So I, I got uh, the, the last few words of what you were saying. Um, so I'm, I, I'm not able to connect the whole. I, I just went off briefly, I'm just coming back. Right. So if, if you can briefly, Re, re, uh, repeat that and then I quickly pick it up. Right. I was saying that the colonial mindset often actually functions through um, our bodies, actually, which are often unrecognizable because it happens so unconsciously um, and uh, in, in a very insidious way, actually. So um, how to recognize those colonial mindsets and how to identify them in order to challenge them. But I was also asking that how um, colonial patriarchal structures also shape masculinity and the man's embodied experiences um, and how these experiences are often not so liberating or empowering as we might think actually so how to even bring the man's embodied experiences into our um, into our discussion on gender question uh, and I particularly would like to hear from you uh, and your work on man and masculinity um, thank you so much uh, moderator um, Yes, uh, how colonial structures shape masculinity. Uh, I think uh, Connor will build on that, but uh, we've seen how the state has been imagined within the colonial setting, uh, uh, the kind of structuring of power from who the colonizer was, at least from, from the history of colonialism from here in Uganda, you get to see a set of British men coming over and, and the women that came over were given a, a very marginal role uh, into the administration, into you know, the governance of, of the colonial state at that time. And that trickled into the understanding of men and women uh, within the colonies and the kind of division of labor and the assumptions upon which colonialism was you know, operated on. Uh, because you had cash economies in which majority of the men were conscripted in with responsibilities to pay tax, which then drew them closer to cash economies and structuring men as you know, the providers of household and the assumption that women were at, you know, at the other low end as dependents on the men, but also on the colonial state. So this, this tendency is continued in the post-colonial. We have seen the definition of maleness largely on the ability to provide. Uh, when COVID-19 set in, in the Ugandan context, and forced majority of the male population from the 
public spaces where they were used too, there was a lot of grumbling on how do I stay at home as a man? What do I do? Um, so I, I, write, I wrote a short piece on how men were struggling learning to stay at home in the context of lockdown. So these public-private divides, you know, the domestic sphere for women, the public sphere for men, which, which in a way have roots in, in colonial structures, have continued in the post-colonial uh, uh, settings. Um, and, and so we, we, still, we still continue to, to see that. And, and also the, the understanding, the, the sort of continuation of these binaries of who men are and that that women cannot be. Um, these binaries are so entrenched, they are so visible um, within uh, a, a education institutions, you, you see them in who takes which course. Uh, we have had students dropping out of, of you know, mechanical engineering because they can't imagine seeing themselves as female engineers, you know, climbing electric poles. And then we are telling them who climbs electric poles in 2020. Uh, There's advanced technology that should enable you, but you can see the mindset is structured on who does what, which subject was introduced for which category of people and preparing for what product. And all these are continuing in the current context. Uh, I want to say that um, the kind of research that we're doing uh, around men and masculinities, we, we still face struggles around the understanding of men, which at times is, you know, that universalized, that we're still looking, getting communities looking at men as universal, as the perpetrator of women's oppression and women as the other. And so when you, you meet a face like mine in, in a, a women's conference, I've got to explain many times why I'm not in, I am in that space. Um, there are many times I have explained myself why I am there. The question is, this is, this is a women's conference. This is a women's space. Why are you here? And there's no definition of gender relations that becomes meaningful without looking at that relationality. And, and so you, you've had, as, as you know, Cornwall articulated at one point, you've had strategies that have moved to look at gender as a relational category, moving towards looking at relations between men and women. But again, you see men missing into such kind of conversations. So we, 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 you, you make one step forward and then you meet another form of resistance. But this is a continued conversation uh, where we are saying we need to critically look at what should be the place of, of men and women in imagining equitable communities. What should be the position, uh, what, that place where we can start looking at gender equality as something that is beneficial to men themselves so that they have a stake in looking for gender equality, in supporting gender equality, in doing things that are equitable to their lives, but also to the lives of women and other categories they live with. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, well, uh, very rightly, you actually highlighted the issue that the gender is a relational concept. And if we want to change the way in which the women are treated in society, we have to understand gender in a relational term. Women is not an independent autonomous category, but their subjectivity is defined in relation to man's subjectivity. So thank you very much for raising this point. I would like to invite uh, Professor Conwell here because as far as I know actually um, Professor Conwell has done one of the some of the pioneering work on the question of masculinity in development if I recall um, uh, Professor Conwell's uh, publications actually some of them rather several years old now actually where were the pioneering publications on the masculinity question in uh, development um, so Professor Conwell it would be nice actually if you could also share some of your thoughts on man and masculinity particularly 
globally and how they relate to the uh, colonial practices and how can we include that into our decolonization and development debates. Certainly, and I think I, I would have uh, very little to add to what Amon has just said, because I agree absolutely with everything uh, that he's just said. Um, I think it's really important to get beyond a single notion of um, men. So uh, in the early work that I did with Nancy Lindisfarne many years ago, uh, we looked at multiple masculinities at the idea that there are very many ways of expressing masculinity. There are many ideals of masculinity and dominant ideals of masculinity, which may have come directly from colonial ideas about the husband, about the breadwinner, are only one variant. They're a very strong variant and they're so strong in some places that it's very difficult to be another variant and to not be the kind of man who fits with those stereotypes. But actually, I think what we're, what we're uh, working in in this field is to say, actually, there are a range of different ways of being a man. And actually, a lot of men are very badly affected by patriarchal social arrangements and power relations. And if we unpack that category, men, and we look at all the different ways and ideals of masculinity and ways of being a man um, and create the possibility for that to be a conversation about the kind of men that men want to be, it's exactly possible, I think, as Amon put so well, you know, that men actually have an identification with what it might um, take to, to work for gender equality because men will relate as much as, as anybody would relate to an idea around dignity, around justice, around rights, around you know, working in common cause around uh, issues of power. So I think getting away from really those really kind of unhelpful stereotypes about men, uh, particularly men as you know, all men are, are problematic, men as the perpetrator, women as the victim, um, which has been so mobilized, so, so many tropes that are used in gender and development of that kind, um, takes us away from that. I think also um, the relationality is not only a binary relation, so femininity is not only defined in relation to masculinity, there are plural femininities, there are plural masculinities, there are plural genders. And I think if we shake it all up like this and start to think of this in a much more dynamic way, we can start to relate it more to notions of equality. Um, I think also working on those ideals, on uh, inspecting the ideals, to what extent are we reproducing those ideals and the ways in which we're treating our own children, the ways in which we're responding to each other, the way that we're working in our institutions, what assumptions are being carried with those ideals, deals in our everyday practices is a really important piece and I want to speak to something else that uh, also that Amon raised which is about the kind of gender stereotyping that accompanies the kind of work that people imagine themselves doing and a very powerful uh, Brazilian government intervention in the northeast of Brazil in the state of Pernambuco with rural agricultural workers um, which involved working first of all it was working with sugarcane workers and with fruit farm workers um, women workers and the intervention was to train them in vocational training to get different kinds of jobs from the jobs that they were doing in the agricultural sector because of the nature of exploitation in that sector. Uh, but what they did was not train them directly in other kinds of jobs. All the people who took part in the scheme had, first of all, classes in what they call citizenship and public policies, politicas publicas in Portuguese. It's sort of broader than, than social policy in a way. It's sort of ideas about citizenship and entitlement and what the state should do for you and also what your rights are as a citizen and these workshops were consciousness raising workshops they used feminist consciousness raising methods so they got people to step back from their everyday lives to examine the kind of assumptions they had about what it meant to be a woman or a man or whatever genders um, in that context it got them to think about their history and about the history of race in brazil the history of exploitation and the history of uh, politics in brazil so they understood a bit more about themselves in the world and were able to develop a critical consciousness in Paulo Freire's terms to really interrogate why do we carry on having these assumptions? What are we thinking about ourselves as women? Um, and what are we carrying into our everyday lives in these, some, these thoughts? Because they're not helpful to us. They're not going to allow us to be able to grow and to prosper and to succeed. And then the programme, after they first did that phase, then opened up for those women opportunities for vocational training. And rather than choosing to do jewellery making or hairdressing or any of those traditionally female kind of crafts, women were signing up to learn soldering, uh, electrician, driver, jobs that were seen as being men's jobs. Um, and they, with a quite conscious sense of there's a lot of construction work available in this state, why should we not do it? What assumptions have we carried in the past about what we can't do that have limited us, that we've now critically inspected 
Um, and we can now say, well, actually, yeah, we can do this. We would like to do it. Actually, it'd be quite fun to, to learn how to do these things. And I was very struck by that program because what it did was it, it really empowered those women to feel as if they had the right to make all kinds of choices that would have been limited if they'd still had this very restricted ideal of what it meant to be a woman. And I guess learning from that program, the Brazilian government was able, the, the state government, they could scale it up to tens of thousands of workers. They made a huge difference in those people's lives. And these are things that could be transferred. They could be done and they are being done um, in communities where you do have a piece of the program that's about consciousness. It's about looking at the world differently. Um, and then from that different look, seeing the horizons of possibility widening and then being able to act. And that's what, to me, what empowerment's about. It's not about people being able to earn money and spend the money and then feel as if they're empowered. It's actually about that change in mindset. Sorry to go on a bit, but I think it's a really positive example in the agricultural area that actually is about cultivating equality. Yeah, what a wonderful example, actually. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, I'd like to invite Tanya, actually. Tanya, would you like to share some of your thoughts, actually, about this discussion here? I mean, particularly, um, I mean, of course, you have done excellent work, uh, you being yourself an indigenous woman, and you just actually shared at the end of your talk um, your own dilemma, actually, that stepping out of your own indigenous context, um, pursuing a university um, uh, education, actually, and how it has removed you from that particular cultural context and when you go back there you kind of feel that dilemma of, of having been removed so do you want to reflect actually uh, your own experience in terms of I mean relating but you don't have to uh, with Professor Cornwall and Dr. Moines actually remarks about um, plural fem um, femininities plural uh, masculinities and whether you would also like to extend your uh, your your thoughts on the man in among the indigenous communities actually and how do you look at the man women relations but also plural forms of um, gender actually in the indigenous context um, tanya thank you very much asia and i think that's an important question because i during the whole presentation i was talking about indigenous communities but when we say indigenous communities, it seems like we talk about them like they were homogeneous and that's not the case. And they change from one place to other and the rules change from one place to other. Just in, in the same Mexico, I can describe you of some matri matriarchal societies that we have. Uh, the, the classical example is the Mushes of Oaxaca where um, there's a third gender uh, well recognized or a, a, just recently I learned from some of the native Americans in the U.S. that have these two spirits, a uh, gender, right? Uh, so it's 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 quite diverse. Um, so I think one of the struggles I quite frequently face uh, it's uh, linked to how do we understand women empowerment um, at different levels. So one of the discussions we frequently have it's with feminist movements, for example, with the Me Too or what it means to a, enact your freedoms within the communities. I think what gender uh, or, or, or women empowerment mean, empower means within the communities, it's, it's different because it's also constrained by the local, like Andrea said, the local norms and rules. And, 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 and it might seem that we are talking about multiple ways of enacting gender because they are constrained to the space. Um, let's just mention about political participation. Some of the women or in some of the communities are just fighting to be able to be elected when there's no access to land tenure just because you're a woman, then your struggles become a bit different. Um, so I feel like being be, be, having been trained in a Western society, and that was one of the discussions I had with a, a colleague that it's a Navajo woman was like we we are framed and we are thought um, I don't want to call it like liberal in a liberal way but we are framed by by by, by what's happening in, in the western science in the western ideas but at the same time when we come to our communities and we want to confront many of those things within the communities we find that sometimes they are not so easy to implement because again the norms and rules are different and you have to adapt to to what's happening within this context um 
I don't know. I think that's what what I could add. I, I, I there's there's a clear struggle. I still don't know exactly how to face it, but what I know that's what I was giving the example of the hat. The hats. Every time you are entering to a new place, it seems like you have to be adjusting that hat to set yourself within the context because we could also a make the mistake to come and try to impose some ideas that might not be fitting the context. Well done. Um, well said. Sorry, I meant to say well said, Tanya. Um, Tanya, would you also like to uh, reflect on the earlier question that, um, you know, the decolonization um, and how uh, decolonization of mind actually um, needs to be thought about in a different way, how going back actually is not an option uh, and how to move forward. Um, often in the debates on decolonization, um, the indigenous knowledge, the other forms of knowledge actually come up as a kind of um, hegemonic other sort of uh, becomes a, a, a reference point actually to question the dominant forms of knowledge. Um, and, and in doing that also often indigenous forms of knowledge is are being glorified, um, they are being romanticized, or as you yourself mentioned that the indigenous societies are also being looked upon as if they are homogeneous, um, they live in a, some kind of a pristine environment actually. So do you also have some kind of thoughts how to understand because you also wear double hats you are an activist you are an indigenous woman yourself um, and and now you are a university scholar you are actually part of the development community in itself as a critical thinker um, so do you want to respond to something about also this uh, decolonization of mind and how should that relate to the indigenous forms of knowledge yeah, so I think, well, uh, when I join many of the discussions that link to indigenous knowledge, let's just give us an example, the recent UNA Food System Summit. Um, one of the things we were doing as part of the Global Hub uh, of Indigenous People's Food Systems was to try to bring evidence on, because it seems like when we talk about indigenous knowledge, people criticize us a lot because they say like, you talk about how pretty is indigenous knowledge, but you don't actually tell us in terms of a scientific language, what actually means. And I also get confronted with some of my peers because they say, why should Western science validate indigenous knowledge? And then I, yeah, I, I agree, why should it? But at the same time, being a scientist, if we want to create a common ground, we need to establish some way to have a dialogue. And if that dialogue means also trying to learn the, the a, rules of the game in terms of indigenous knowledge, then that also means that we need to portray. Um, and that's what actually communities or many indigenous communities are doing. It's it's a, if we need to portray and show evidence metrics a, of why our knowledge, our knowledge is valuable, why we should do this or the other, people is starting to do that because one of the ways to survive, and I think moving from the, a dichotomies or or this idea of the pristine. Um, I think evidence also shows that most of the communities that have been able to hybridize or mix or incorporate into modern ways of society or mixing different different elements are the ones that are, have actually coexisted in a better way because they need to adapt to a changing world at the same time. Um, so I, I still think one of my one of the things I always say, like, it's yes, I believe strongly on local capacities that we need to reinforce local capacities, but that's not going to be enough. Like my Navajo friend said, a, even though we have trained many indigenous peoples to come and play a role in science and policy making, if we also don't make institutional changes on actually how a, we should commit or what it's important for the communities, not only in terms of how many papers do I want to publish, how much I'm getting for every dollar that I'm investing in, in this research, but also how we can actually contribute uh, to something that is more tangible to the communities, or how can we have different outputs that are considered valid also for the donors. A, we won't make these huge changes because then again, many of these researchers get trapped into this world and we need to sort of try to find a way on how we can keep con the, the, the communication with communities. And just to close, and that's a challenging question, going back to the food summit, some, someone recently challenged me and said, 
well, Tanya, indigenous knowledge sounds amazing and whatever you want, but why should we care if you only account for the 6% of the population? <laughs> And I think then it comes a matter of human rights, right? Um, we also need to, 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 to create narratives. One of the narratives that we use most constantly is in terms of biodiversity, that a lot of the biodiversity is kept in this territory, it's kept in the indigenous territory. So we need, again, like to learn to play the rules of the game. And that's the way we sort of try to, to navigate into a world that is domini dominated by Western science, but at the same time trying to bring what we believe it's important for us. Fantastic. Well, I mean, 6% of the people, just because they are small in number, that doesn't mean that they are no longer human beings. So well said, um, Tanya. Um, we have now five minutes left, actually. And um, I actually want to invite you to say something that you probably could not say, something you still would like to share, actually, in um, relation to what other panel members have said, anything you would like to add. I would start with uh, Dr. Mwan. Am I not? I'm not speaking your name correctly, right? You are trying. You are trying, Mwine. <laughs> I'm really sorry, but I, uh, I actually well. I researched and I I looked for the pronunciation of your name before the session. But do correct yeah. me, please. Don't hesitate to correct me how to speak your name correctly. Um. Yeah, Mwine. Uh, Mwine. I think. As, as we move towards the end, um, I, I wanted to really share one of these interesting concepts I met from an African feminist, uh, Obioma Naimeka, uh, about the idea of border crossing. Because uh, the, the challenge that we seem to be facing is gender binaries, which we get stuck in even when we make two steps out of it, we slide back into, and uh, it could be a concept that could guide uh, uh, the way we do research with open-mindedness of readiness to not only learn about the other, but also learning from the other, uh, because our positions come with a lot of you know, richness of experience, richness of knowledge. And uh, when we seek to stay in our camp and raise a border, there are lots of limitations that we create in knowledge production. Um, and of course, uh, Obioma warns us that border crossing has its own dangers, its seduction, its unpredictability, and it, its humbling moments but it also has its enriching rewards. That border crossing entails learning about the other, but more importantly, it should entail learning from the other. Learning which is tinged with, you know, it, it requires that high dose of humility and with civility. And, and I think it is a concept that calls us to deconstruct, bring down all these barriers that deny us from seeing what is happening from the other, or paying attention and learning from the experiences of the communities where we go, and in order to produce knowledge, co-produce knowledge that can explain our reality. Wonderful. I think learning from the other, it's a beautifully said, actually. It's a beautiful phrase. Thank you very much for raising that. Um, Tanya, I would like to invite you. You have one minute. I'm afraid we are running out of time. Um, and then I would invite uh, Professor Conwell to say the last word. So, Tanya, go ahead, please. Yeah, I, I pretty much like what um, Wynne said. I think I'm having problems to pronounce your name too, sorry. Uh, uh, I would say yes, learning from the other, but I would say also as practitioners and um, scientists, we should reflect also on what we do because I feel like many times when we are implementing projects, there's not so much time for reflection. And it's important because then that would also move us into a different direction. Wonderful. Well said. Professor Conwall. Thank you. And uh, apologies to Wiener. I was uh, calling you Amon because I thought that was uh, the name that you'd um, 
you were called, so apologies for that. Um, the, so my building on both of these uh, earlier contributions, learning from the other, reflecting, and then I think there's something really valuable about taking concepts that come from non-Western contexts, so, and thinking about the productivity that they could have in helping us to understand things in other contexts. So two concepts to throw in here, which both of which relate to um, the field of, uh, that we're talking about. One is from Felicia Kajuba, who's Nigerian, um, no longer with us, uh, an amazing um, thinker, and her concept of hearthold, which is not the household, it's the place in which people are fed. So actually the hearthold is the space, that, the place that the woman creates around her in terms of feeding, a man creates around in terms of feeding the people who they're responsible for feeding. And it helps you to think very differently um, and out of the box of this uh, very constrictive, um, I think, uh, colonial notion of the, heart, the household and the head of the household and so on. So does that map onto other contexts? Is it something that's useful to think with? And then the last one is to think about, um, again, um, for a Nigerian, uh, feminist thinker Malara Ogodipwe Leslie, who reminds us that we need to think of women beyond the coital and conjugal sites in which they're normally located in Western feminism. So again, thinking of women's relations and gender relations, not just being about marriage and about heterosexual partnership, but about the, the range of different kinds of relationships. And it relates back to what we said uh, earlier on about multiple femininities and masculinities. But again, understanding gender in development is about getting that and understanding that women's relationships in the workplace, in, in the broader family, um, in society, may be even more important than the one, uh, the relationship with the men that they're living with. And they may not even see the men who they're living with very much in their own household. Um, and so I think this putting those things in context um, becomes really important because of these notions about oppression and about power and also about change and where the sources of empowerment and disempowerment are need to be really understood uh, better if you can help uh, to, to move away from these very kind of quite narrow notions about households and wives and husbands. Wonderful. I think this is a beautiful note on which to end this session, heart hold. Let's keep it uh, close to our hearts, actually also to build the communities of heart um, and build the, the heart hold uh, instead of the families and then uh, sort of reproduce those heterosexual normativity. Instead, we create newer, different forms of relationships and different forms of communities and households. So um, on that note, I would like to um, say that this session would come to an end. Thank you very much for all the three panelists for making this such a beautiful, such an inspiring, thought-provoking session. Um, and all the contributors to this session, actually, I would like to remind you that this session is also recorded, so you would be able to visit it um, anytime you would like. Thank you very much, all the participants and particularly the three panel uh, speakers, keynote speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.